Let's receive the offering. Am I on? Yeah. I'm not on? I'm not on? I'm on. <laughs> Chris, don't be playing games with me now. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Well, good morning to everybody. Before the kids leave, I'd like to pray for them for a moment. I think it's a wise thing to do. Let's bring them up here. And uh, there's only two of them, so it'll only take about a half an hour. Boy, I tell you, sometimes people don't laugh for anything. Yeah? Okay, stand up, guys, with me for a moment. Let's stretch our hands towards them. This is our generation, our, our future, right? So, Father, in the name of G uh, Linda, can I ask you to come up also, please? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God, for our children in the name of Jesus. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus on them, and we thank you, Lord, for a hedge of protection over them. Lord, I pray that you are using them in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that they will be, in, their, in this generation, they will be a light shining bright for you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for guidance. Thank you for Holy Spirit guiding them and showing them and teaching them. Lord, keep them away from people that want to take advantage of them. In the name of Jesus, Lord, help them to see clear and to understand in the name of Jesus. I pray a hedge of protection over them. In Jesus' name. And we all say amen, amen and amen. Praise God. Have we received the offering, Joseph? Let's pray, let's believe God, and we're going to get into the Word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace on our finances. We thank you for wisdom and clarity. Lord, open the windows of heaven that we can see clearly how to live and how to give in Jesus' name. Thank you for it, Lord. We bless them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, let's go to the Word of God. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I have been praying about what I needed to share about and so I've really been speaking on love here for the last couple of weeks. And I sensed in my heart that the Spirit of the Lord wants me to just camp there for a while. Is, are, are we okay with that? Uh, because I know sometimes we need more revelation, but I don't believe you need more revelation. I just believe we need to act on the revelation that we receive. Right? Because a lot of times we hear about this, and love is not a really, it, believe it or not, it's not a very popular topic. And I can sense sometimes that, you know, the anointing will dip when we talk about it, because a lot of people don't receive it the way we should. But how many know that uh, there's a lot of things that can happen in your life, and you might not be aware of it, and we may be blaming other people or blaming what our bosses or what the people are doing, but not aware that our unloving them is actually helping us to be in that place or keeping us in a place. And so sometimes we, we have symptoms in our physical body and we're praying for healing, but unforgiveness can actually cause that, right? Poverty, sometimes unforgiveness can cause that. And so we, as, as a church, we brought this up last week, we need to be united and we need to think the same. So the Lord has already equipped us to walk in this type of love. So now the Lord has anointed us we are anointed to actually establish his will in this generation. How many believe that? So you are anointed by God to establish his will in this generation. And we have all the rights of heaven right here and right now. We do. And so Satan knows how powerful we are when we actually love the way God has instructed us to love. Right? The Lord has instructed us to love. God, Jesus gave us a commandment. Anybody know the commandments that the Lord gave us? One of them is actually he commanded us to love each other. Okay, that really went over really good. So if Jesus was here and stand before you and say, I command you to love each other, I, I think we need to really consider that statement. So that's a command to love each other. <laughs> Never mind, Byron. You'll have your chance on Monday. Forget you. <laughs> I, I sit nervous on Monday because he, every time he walks by me, I'm like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've been good though. No, really, the Lord instructed us. He actually commanded us to walk in love. And I think most, most of the body of Christ don't recognize how profound this is. Or what is the benefit of walking in love? How important it is for you and your family to walk in love? 
because I know that there are many wounded people in our church. And sometimes we think we, we, you know, we just give them what we believe or speak what we think they should hear and so on, instead of just actually listening to them. And love is a very powerful force, and I think the enemy uses actually other people to get you into a place where you begin to separate from the body of Christ, from your brother or sister. And so now, Ezekiel, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. I want us to look at Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27. So I want to say this before we get going here, that love is the master key to unlocking the power of God in your life. Okay. So if somebody said, I, I, I need a key, this is the master key. And so now it brings healing, brings the anointing, it produces miracles. What we say, what is this? It's the love that God has placed. It brings it on the scene in our, in our hearts. So now the only way to wash away darkness is by shining the light of God's love on it. The only way to get rid of it. And without love, let me, listen to me, we're powerless. We have no power. Without love, we are powerless. And so you, you think about why am I not uh, seeing some things? You know, Terry said something this morning and I thought it was really good. He said, you know, everybody works for a paycheck, right? We don't go to work for nothing. How many work for nothing just because you're a nice person? Anybody else listening? <laughs> Does anybody work for nothing? Nobody works for nothing. But you expect a paycheck every week. True? And so love, actually, if we walk without love, we're working very, very hard and get no paycheck. That's what he said. So I thought that was really good. And so now, without love, we have no power. This is the kind of love that is, we're talking about more than just a feeling. It's a decision that we make. And a decision that you make that you're going to walk in love, you're going to encounter one thing. As soon as you make a decision to walk in love, you're going to find very challenging people come your way. And I guarantee you that because you'll be tested on that. And so the key is that you remain in love. And sometimes you have to bite your tongue so hard. You know, maybe not bite, just make a decision not to actually walk out of love. And so you're going to have opportunities every day to walk out of love. Every day you're going to have an opportunity for somebody to say something, somebody to look at you, somebody to, uh, you know, gossip about you. You're going to have opportunities every day. And sometimes people go from people, you know, work, job to job, church to church, and they're thinking, well, they're not loving. But I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you something, that the church is not a building. We are the church. And it doesn't matter where we go, we need to be loving right? We can go into any type of church, and I'm talking a Christian church, and love them where they are. We don't have to teach them. We don't have to pretend that we're better than them. We can be honest, but we can be also thoughtful, right? Because we're, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so this is the master key that unlocks the power of God in, in a service or in a place. And you know, what's interesting is that I worked in a bar for many, many years before I started teaching. And the truth is that I, I've, I've encountered a lot of wonderful Christians that didn't agree with me sharing the gospel with people that needed it. Isn't that interesting? And it, it really puzzled me because I, for, for the longest time, I would I, talk to a pastor or talk to other people and saying, what are you doing in a bar? And I'm thinking, well, I'm ministering to these people. And they, they look at you as, as if though you are, you know, um, a little weird or they think that you are taking advantage by, you know, selling them booze or in one hand you're giving them booze, on the other hand you're preaching the gospel, it's kind of weird. But, you know, the truth is that I wasn't really pushing the booze, but I was pushing Jesus on them. <laughs> but many received, many received, and many got healed and many got, I, I tell you, the power of God would flow in that bar in a beautiful way. But I, I, you know, here's another thing that I, I realized one time. There was one time I was, I'll never forget this. We were sitting in, um, a, a musician came to play uh, at, at our bar. And so his girlfriend uh, was a little open to Jesus. Her boyfriend was completely, completely, no, 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 I don't believe in Jesus. And so uh, there was something wrong with her knee. And so we said, let's go pray, you know. So we went in, the, in, in my office. That's where I used to pray a lot of the time. And so I thought, oh, there's a Christian brother of mine. 
I would like him to actually help me. And I thought, praise God, let, let, I'll bring him in because he can help me pray. So I invited him, and I thought right away, this is a mistake. This is a mistake. And so we're sitting there, and I said, so we're going to pray. These guys are still unbelievers, right? We don't push the gospel on the people. So I said, I'm going to pray, and we're going to believe God. And so, they, okay, whatever. And so um, I started, I closed my eyes, and I, and I said, everybody, you can close your eyes with me if you know. There's about five people in the office. And so I started praying. And when I started praying, I really sensed a strong anointing. Well, uh, I opened my eyes, and she said, uh, she goes, when you put your hand on my knee, I felt warmth go all the way through my body. And I said, uh, I did not put my, your hand, my hand on your knee. She says, yeah, you did. I said, no, I did not. <laughs> I didn't. I, and her boyfriend, who doesn't want anything to do with Jesus, he goes, he didn't. Because his eyes were wide open. I thought, thank you, Jesus. That's all I need, right? <laughs> but the Lord did something, and, and healing started working in her, you know. And so my Christian friend said, he goes, are, are you guys saved? And they said, well, we don't, what do you mean we're saved? From like what kind of thing, right? Or are you a Christian? Well, no. He goes, you're going to go to hell if you don't get sa saved and, go and get Jesus. And I'm like, shut up. <laughs> Shut up, you know, because they don't need to hear about hell. They're already living in hell, right? What do they need? They need love. They need the gospel, the good news. The good news is Jesus loves them. And sometimes it's better just the, 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 the vocabulary of silence is probably the best thing that we could do sometimes. And so I just prayed. She knows now that somebody touched her. That was an experience. But you know, and then all of a sudden, so the guy said to me, he goes, so you mean to tell me I'm going to hell? Yep, he says. And I'm like, you know, I said, you know what, let's just go out. <laughs> let's get out of here. So I said, stop it to him. And I took him and said, stop it. He says, well, you got to teach them. And I thought, you know, sometimes, and it's not like he was, you know, that's where he was. I, said, I think, you know, maybe we've been there. But you know, sometimes people just need a little patience. Really, and, and they just need somebody that is compassionate. You don't have to be a stickler to what you know, and you, just because you know, somebody agrees with the rapture, other people don't agree, you don't have to correct them. It's not that big of a deal. They'll go when they'll go. They're just going to get there maybe later or sooner, but who knows, but we're, going, we're all going to go to the same destination. But preaching the gospel, it's like fishing, isn't it? Right? So you fish, <laughs> and you give a little bit, and then you take a little bit. You give a little bit and you take a little bit. And you have to communicate with people in order for them to begin to trust you. Because when they start trusting you, then you could, then, then watch, it's a platform where you can speak into their lives. Right? But if you're just going to force your way on people, they're not going to have that. And I learned a long time ago that speaking to people who don't really know much about Jesus, they have heard a lot of the people that are point the finger at them, that are telling them they're going to hell and they're not. But they, and why did they reject that message? Because there's no love. But I'll tell you the honest truth. When the Spirit of the Lord speaks through you, it's another thing. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I've shared this one before, but there was a gentleman came looking for a job, and we were right in the bar, right in the, in the middle of the bar, and there's people drinking over here, you know, and all of, right in the middle of the bar, and he goes, um, I hear you're the manager. I said, w what would you like? He says, well, I'm looking for a job, and right there, the Lord said to me, and I just saw myself doing that, and I thought, I'm just going to act on it. So I, I put my, my finger in his face and said, you don't need a job. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I know, dropped to his knees right in the middle of the bar and started crying. I led him to the Lord right there. And people are drinking going, what's going on over there, you know? <laughs> but you see, but sometimes the Spirit of God will speak through you. But the difference is you need to know when the Spirit of God is speaking through you. Right? You're not just making an assumption, you know. You know the word assume, right? Should I get into that? Maybe not. All right. Praise God. So, <laughs> Ezekiel 36 and verse 26. Let's, yeah, verse 26. Listen to what God promised in the Old Testament. He says, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put, verse 27, 
my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you will keep my judgment and do them. Now, let me read it from a different translation. He says, the living puts it this way. He says, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new and right desires. Isn't that good? A new desires. And I put a new spirit within you. I'll take out your stony heart of, uh, of sin and give you a new heart of love. How many would like that? Okay. The message puts it this way. I will remove the stone heart from your body and replace it with a heart that is God-willed, not self-willed. The good news is that if you are a born-again believer, the Spirit of God has already moved inside of you. You already have this heart. But love is one of the fruit of the Spirit. And fruit is not a gift. Fruit has to be developed. Right? So that means you're going to have to do some exercising. Now, I, some, sometimes people hear me talk about this and not really consider this. But here's a way to prosper. If you want to see prosperity in your life, here's one way to do it. Here's another way of thinking about this type of love. Because if you want your family to actually reunite, love is the answer. If you want to see the healing in your physical body, love is the answer. Amen. Because now, when you receive the love that the Father has for you, the Bible says that this love that He gives you, if you know it, it will flush out every fear. So fear is not something that we actually, it's, it's actually demonic. It's a spirit. And so fear is, confusion is. So a lot of times we're worrying about what we are going to actually encounter in our future. Now, let, me, let me say this. So my daughter is sitting right there. I like to pick on him every once in a while because, you know, I get the chance to. But now I love her and Tanner. I love Tanner too. I, I love them really uh, with all my heart okay and so i really want to always always i want to see them succeed i want to see them prosper i want to see them blessed and so on so now they know i love them but if they won't receive my love how many know that is very frustrating right and most people will say i receive the love that the father has for me but see if you're worried about god you know your future you're not really taking the word of god to heart because we know in, in Matthew, Jesus said, I'll take care of you. And that's an act of love. But receiving that is the key. So if I was trying to pour my love on someone that doesn't want to receive it, it's a little frustrating for me. Because just think of somebody that you really desire to be with, and you're loving and loving and loving, and you get no feedback. It can be very difficult. And a lot of times I believe that that's what we do to the Lord. Because there's so many areas in my, our lives where the Lord keeps pouring this love. In a, and many times we, we are, we're not saying we don't receive it, but we open up to other areas, you know, and reject that love. You know, I, I believe that the Spirit of the Lord would say, if, if you know that I love you, then you know I'll take care of you. And if you know that he will take care of you, then you don't need to worry for another minute. Right? You don't have to stay up and worry about what is going to happen. All we have to do is receive that love. That's why the Bible says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he'll exalt you in due time. So that type of humility is saying, I receive this love regardless of how I feel, regardless of what I see. I receive it right now in Jesus' mighty name. And as soon as you open up to that love, then watch the blessings start to flow. Amen. Well, that's a, that's a powerful key of wisdom. So he says, I'm going to put inside of you a, a new spirit, this heart of love, and it is the agape love that the Father has for us. And we are to walk in that. So this, these sermons, I want to challenge you to actually act on these sermons, or act on what you're hearing. Okay, thank you for that. I want to challenge you to act on what we're hearing. And I don't want you just to put a face on and pretend in, in the church, because we can all do that. Huh? Sometimes we're really good pretenders. 
But how many know that you need to act that type of way outside of these walls? Right? It's not just in church where you put on the face of, well, this is, <laughs> this is church face, this is work face. You know, this is home face. You know, whatever that, right? But you're, you're to have the same attitude and the same love. But what would happen now if you begin to be the same person in church and at work? You'll have the same effect. You really will. And so you're going to have to do your best to not to have strife in your home. Because that's a powerful weapon that the enemy uses. And you know I've said this before, but I really sense that I need to keep saying it again and again. It's interesting. I, I talk about that and then somebody will come and say, ah, my husband is this. And, oh, and, you know, and it's like, did you hear that sermon? Oh, that was a really good sermon. I'm thinking, yeah, okay. Thank you for that. Right? But the truth is that when you, when you open up to the Spirit of God and you hear and choose to obey that, because sometimes people will give and because they, they obey. Well, and, and the reason why they give is not because they are obeying God. It's because there's a blessing connected with it. Okay. Is that true or not? Right? Because if you say just give, don't think about reaping, people will go, well, <laughs> what's the benefit of that? Right? So they give. But if when you honor God, you give. And so if you really want to honor the Lord, I want us to begin to think on that same page. I'm just going to walk in love. And I'll tell you, again, you're going to be challenged because people will come and they'll start saying some things, but I guarantee you when, when, when you remember these words, you're going to go someplace and they say something and the first thing you're going to go, oh, you, you, you know, I'm going to tell you. As soon as you get like that, just sit back and say, no, I choose to walk in love. Here's what you're doing is you're exercising that muscle of love. You know, when your wife says something that you don't really appreciate. Right? When your husband says something, maybe, you, you know. But here's the thing. Sometimes it's, you, you need to choose your battles. Right? And sometimes they may, they may say something, but you don't know why, why they're saying it. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter why they're saying it. I, they, she already threw the ball at me kind of thing. It's in my court now. And what I do with it is the answer. And so sometimes it's the best thing to do is instead of just saying, you know what I feel, because a lot of times we like to talk about what we feel, but you know, it's better and safer. <laughs> if you, men, you know what I mean by that. It's safer to go into the bathroom and say, Lord, help, you know, show me. Because sometimes we just want to say something and next thing you know, like Byron sleeps on the couch for, you know, six months. Six months is a long time, Byron. <laughs> okay, so here's what the effects of love. Here's what happens when you begin to, to walk in love. You can't buy this. Listen to me, you can't buy this. So the, the effects of love, the first thing that happens, it, it brings healing. You cannot buy healing. Do you, do you see the benefit of that? Okay, here's another effect uh, uh, that actually it happens because you choose to walk in love. It builds a sense of self-worth. Money cannot buy that. Right? It produces a feeling of emotional completeness. It gives security. It equips us to be kind towards those who have misunderstood or misjudged us. Love empowers us to serve others joyfully. It enables us to develop intimacy with the Lord. Because a lot of times if you don't believe that God the Father loves you, you don't actually open up to Him. So it produces intimacy. It, and also drives us to reach others to share God's love. Reach out to other people to share God's love. So now, are we willing to obey what the, the Lord is, is telling us to do? So go with me to 1 Peter 3.8 in the Amplified, please, if you want to bring that up. I have really powerful things I want to share with you. You know, this, this part of the sermon, I've had this for the last four weeks that I haven't been able to speak on. Hopefully I'll get there today. 
But 1 Peter 3, 8, listen, listen to what I'm going to say, because sometimes pressure in life can be overwhelming. Any, anybody believe that? But you know what? It doesn't give us a right to be mean. It doesn't give us a right to be rude. Right? You, you don't just be, become an angry person just because bad things are happening to you. And you shouldn't be mean to other people just because, you know, somebody's saying something or whatever. So sometimes the best thing to do is just walk away. You know, yesterday I thought, me, me and Tracy, we thought we were going to see a big fight. Yeah, we're sitting in the, in the car and we're waiting. And this guy comes in in front of us and slams on his horn and and he opens the window and gives the gentleman in the other car the finger. So Tracy goes, oh, get your camera. Get your camera. Because, <laughs> you know, just, just like my wife, she's thinking, we need to make money somehow, right? Put it on YouTube. <laughs> but this, I, I don't know what happened there, but, you know, I'm sitting there and going, what is going on? And so the other guys, they opened the window and uh, they started giving them a bouquet. Anybody know what a bouquet is? Right? It's, uh, it's, it's this, right? But if you took the one finger, it's just one. This is a bouquet. <laughs> so they started, you know, giving each other the finger. And I thought to myself, I thought, what's wrong with people? And so I drove by, and this guy is about 50, 60 years old. And then we, then we realized that they're actually friends. <laughs> we thought, we're not making any money on this. <laughs> so I gave him the No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but now, and I thought to myself, I thought, this guy is like 60 years old and he's acting like he is a 20 year old. When are we going to grow up? I thought, how sad is that? How sad is that? They're acting like, a, you know, teenagers. And I don't know why I said that. Anyways, so listen, listen, <laughs> listen to, <laughs> listen to 1 Peter 3 8, the Amplified. He said, finally, finally, somebody say, thank God. Uh, you, you should be of one and the same mind. So this is, the, this is what Peter is talking to us and telling us that we should be in one mind, united in spirit, sympathizing with others, loving each other as brethren or brethren of one household, compassionate, courteous, tender-hearted, and humble. How many would like to take a black marker to that? Uh, okay, no. <laughs> so, because we highlight these things. This is not something that we look at and we think this is fun. This is something that we need to look at and saying, if I'm a born again believer and the Spirit of the Lord has put love in my heart, this is something I need to obey. So, I, I, I promise you, a lot of times you won't see scriptures like this highlighted in other people's Bible because they don't recognize how profound this is. But look, it goes on to say, never return evil for evil. Never return insult for insult, scolding or tongue lashing. <laughs> and he says, put on, uh, where am I here? Put on the, contra the, the blessing or uh, contrary blessing, praying for their welfare, their happiness and protection. And pity them, he says, pity them, and loving, uh, love them. He says, look, listen to, to these words. He says, for know that to this you have been called. He says, you've been called to live this way. That you pray for them. That you love them where they are. Because a lot of times we like to give people conditions. I love you when you change. But aren't you thankful that the, Father, the Lord never done that with you? No, he loved us where we are, and he received us where we are. And sometimes we like to see people change, but by scalding them, they're not going to change. By, by rebuking them, they're not going to change. But by loving them, you can help them to overcome this thing. I realized a long time ago when you insult somebody, you've stopped ministering to them. You shut the door on the ministry right away, right? And it's easy for us to get mad, but there is a person in that body that needs to know freedom right they, they need to know freedom and if you are a child of God you have this freedom abiding on the inside of you that the whole world needs to hear about so he says you've been called to this 
He says, and then you may inherit, I love this, that you may yourself inherit a blessing from God, that you may obtain the blessing as heir, bringing welfare, happiness, and protection. And I believe that's to you. He says, if you want to see protection in your life, walk in love. If you want to see welfare, walk in love. If you want to see that freedom that God has provided and you've inherited, inherited he says, walk in that type of love. So I, I know that this is not a popular message, but I'm telling you the honest truth that sometimes nobody needs to see you, but sometimes you need to see yourself on your knees praying for somebody that doesn't like you. Oh, boy. Because that's when you begin to consider the heart of the Father for that. So loving the Lord makes us sensitive to each other. Right? We talked about honoring a person last week. You honor them, you bring the best out of them. When you honor a person, that's your gift to them. You're helping them open up and actually be free. So look at this powerful picture. And so the Bible says we need to be like Jesus. Go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 10, and verse 29. Anybody know about the Good Samaritan? All right. So we've read this before, and I think a lot of us uh, kind of heard this. But, you know, this is really important for us to see what Jesus is saying here. So the Lord is speaking to a lawyer here. And the lawyer says something very interesting. He says, you know, uh, what, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And so he was actually questioning the Lord. He wasn't really asking an honest question. He was questioning. And so this lawyer said to Jesus, what, what am I going to do, you know, to, to inherit, you know? And so Jesus said, you know, what is written in the law? And he says, what, what's written in the law? He says, well, you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, with all your mind, and your neighbor, your neighbor, your neighbor as yourself. And so this gentleman Actually, look at verse 29. Um, yeah, well, and verse 28 says, And he said to him, you, you have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. So this, this gentleman asked, said, This is what uh, the law said. And so Jesus said, You've answered correctly. But here, verse 29, he says, This person actually began to justify himself. And so just like a lawyer would say, who, who, Who's then my neighbor? Who's my neighbor? And so Jesus said, and he answered and said to him, he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And so this is really powerful and is very prophetic. Okay? And so if, if the Lord will allow me to, I'll, I'll share some powerful prophetic truth in this. But I want you to see the Father's heart first and foremost before we get into the prophetic. Is that okay? So the Father's heart. So he said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and this person fell among some thieves who stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And so I was reading that yesterday, and I thought, you know, how many of us have had this problem? You know, many times we have been, we've encountered people that are mean and hurt and actually robbed us. And he says, uh, verse 31, and by chance a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And the Levi, likewise the Levi, he says, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed on by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, thank God, as he journeyed, he came and he saw him. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He had compassion on him. And he went to him, bandaged his wound, pouring oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So it wasn't just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to feed him. But notice, notice the compassion that the Lord had on this person. And he says, the next day he departed and he took two denarius with him and gave it to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. And whatever you need, wh whatever you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. So I want you to see some here, something here, that this is the father's heart that we need to have for each other. So Jesus basically answered who his neighbor was and how he was to actually love his neighbor, didn't he? Because that, that was the question. Well, I, you know, I've done these things, and so Jesus said, go do that. And so he goes, well, who's my neighbor then? Well, then Jesus went out to tell him that even a stranger 
that got caught up and people have robbed him and, and bad things have happened to this guy. This person actually encountered robbers and he was stripped from his clothing and uh, his belongings and people beat him. <laughs> and so he's half dead, naked, half dead. But this person went to him, bandaged his wound, gave him help, put him on his own donkey or what the animal and took him to an inn. He took care of him. So the prophetic side is this, because this is so powerful. And when, I, when, you, when you start thinking about this, you begin to recognize that this is just, this is a double-edged story here. So Jesus is actually the Good Samaritan. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. And so uh, a Good Samaritan is actually the person that has compassion, and he's a compassionate person who is unselfish and actually helps others. That's what Jesus came and did. And so the priest here represents the law. The priest represents the law. The Levite represents prophets, the prophets. So the law and the prophets could not help this person. And so Jerusalem is heaven. Jericho is the world. Right? And so the, the main message is to walk in love. But I want you to see something here. So Jesus is the one that came to this world. He came from heaven, from Jerusalem, to the earth, and actually in Jericho, he went to Jericho, and he began to, bond, uh, you know, uh, help that, that person that was uh, bound. And that was a picture like us. That's who we are. That, that's a type of the world. He came, and he actually ministered to them. But he said something so profound. He took him to, the, he poured on oil and, and wine, which actually is like the Word of God, but actually also he said to the innkeeper, which I believe represents the Holy Spirit, and he said to the innkeeper, uh, whatever you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. He gave him two days' wages, which means 2,000 years. That's powerful. I don't know if you got that, but... So he gave him two days' wages. So that means Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and he was the good Samaritan that went to... The, you know, to help that person that needed help. And he saw us were, were uh, robbed. He saw us, he, you know, you got robbed from your inheritance and everything that the enemy stole from us. But not only did he actually gave his life for us, but he actually is the one teaching you. He's the one helping you. He's the one instructing you. And so he, the innkeeper represents the Holy Spirit. And he said to him, whatever you, you pay, when I come again, two days wages. So we know that Jesus is coming soon. But I believe that the Spirit of the Lord is really instructing us right now to walk in this type of love. I, have you ever thought, Lord, this person is going through something. What is my part? What should I do to help them? Because you, when you begin to think like that, then you're taking your eyes off of yourself and you're begi you begin to consider that other person and you begin to actually prayerfully help them. And nobody needs to know. Right? Because there's sometimes that the Spirit of the Lord will give me a, show me a person and I'll go interceding for them and I don't have to tell them that I was praying for them. It's really, it, it's the Lord placed that on my heart. But I, I'll never forget this I, this encounter I had at, at, at Victory Christian Center when I went. And, I, you know, one day I went to, to that church and I was kind of feeling down. I wasn't really, you know, and uh, just needed somebody to talk to. And this little lady, this little lady, I, I don't know her much, but she came and she kind of snuck between the chairs and she came and she pointed, I, I, not, that's so powerful. She pointed her little finger and she says, you, I have been praying for you. Oh, my Lord. And the presence of God just hit me, and I thought, somebody's praying for me. Somebody's praying for me. She goes, the Lord keeps bringing you in my <laughs> I thought I thought she was maybe mad at <laughs> first. But just imagine that type of heart. So how many people are praying for you right now? And you don't even know them. But there's people across in, in the world. We're one body, guys. We're one body. And you know that when you're going through some type of danger, somebody in Africa may get a dream about you and never seen you before, never heard about you. But the Lord will say, pray for that person. 
or they see a dangerous thing happening and they'll begin to say, dear Lord, help that person. You don't know how many times people are praying for you on a daily basis. And you're not alone. But the key is not to be so selfish. Right? And so when the Lord tells you, you know, to get up and pray for somebody, what do we do? Just do it. Because as soon as you begin to be obedient like that, listen, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. So if you want other people to be praying for you, be praying for other people. We need each other. Look, we need each other. And I think we're, we're too quick to judge other people by looking at them and thinking, well, they did this wrong and they did that wrong, as if we know better. But it, it just comes down to, you know, just loving that person. Do you have somebody in your life at one point that actually made a decision just to be a person of encouragement in your life? You know, when you see somebody that just goes to you and says, you know what, I, I, I appreciate you. And just begin to pour into your life. That's the person that helped you come out of your shell. I've had uncles, I've had cousins that just poured their love in me. And I thank God for that. But I've also had brothers and sisters that did the same thing. I know Terry, my brother, and, and Tara did that for me. And so at one point, I really had a, a really struggling, struggling beginnings. You know, I, I couldn't speak properly. I couldn't, you know, explain things. But, you know, they kept on encouraging me and encouraging me. And it brought me out of that prison that I was in. And I thank God for people like that, that will put, put the effort to begin to pour love in other people. Because they're all around us, people that are hurting. One of the main person that actually strengthened me was my wife. And it's what's a, what a blessing. Because so many times I'll go home and I just wanted to just not talk to anybody. But she was always there for me. You know, what, how, what a blessing that is to have people like that in your life. We need to be thankful of that type of a person. But I want to challenge you to be that person. I want to challenge you. Because we can all look at another person and say, yeah, that's wrong with you, that's wrong with you, and that's wrong with you, and you're this and you're that. But why don't we look at the uh, good side and say, this is what's good about you. This is what I love about you. Because as soon as you begin to actually speak that, those kind words to them, it begins to put confidence in them to bring them out of that shell. And sometimes love is, f is stern. But the truth is that we don't have to be rude. And we don't have to be obnoxious, but we can speak into their hearts. Do you know that the Lord Jesus, you know, you know when you think about, look, look at, think about that man. Here's that man going on a journey, and all of a sudden these robbers came and beat him and robbed him and so on. And I, you think about sometimes somebody that is maybe not up to your standard, and you look at them and you think, what happened to that person? What is wrong with, what, what happened to that lady? How many times she's been abused? Because they act a certain way because they're hurting. How many times they've been hurt? I wonder when was the last time somebody just looked at them? Right? You see what I mean by that? Just looked at them and thought, what do you need? What can I do for you? Instead of just judging them by, by what, what, you know, how they look on the outside. But just think about the last time somebody looked at you and considered you and thought, what can I do to help you? How can I be an encouragement to you? Do you realize that, that many brothers and sisters go home and spend hours alone by themselves? That's what they do. They spend hours alone. And they may have a group of people around them, but they're sitting in their lonely chair and they're sitting at home just maybe looking at the wall, have nobody to talk to. And you think, well, where are they? Maybe I can help them. They're all over here. They're all over here. And sometimes people, we, we, we close the door on other people because we don't want to be hurt. Right? We don't want to be hurt because we've been hurt so many different times. You don't want to tell people what you're going through or what you've done or what happened. Because the truth it comes down to is people don't want their dirty laundry all over. Right? But you think about a person, you, see, you might look at them and say, what is going on in that person's life? 
There was a lady that attended our church. I, I can't remember. that She just came for a couple of months. I don't know, maybe Tracy will remember her. Maybe Terry and Tara will. But she came for a couple of months, and uh, she was very pleasant. And in the beginning stages, she was dealing with some type of, uh, you know, um, maybe anxiety and something like that. But I didn't know she was dealing with suicide. And then one person, at one time, actually, she went and committed suicide. And I, I didn't know, and I thought, where, where is she? You know, I haven't seen her, you know, for a couple of days. And then somebody comes and said, you know that lady that, and I thought, yeah, well, she committed suicide. And it really, it, it was heavy on me. It's like, how come I didn't catch that? What, why didn't I see that? And sometimes we condemn ourselves. But, you know, you don't know where, where your brother is. Maybe your brother is having suicidal thoughts. Maybe somebody in your family is struggling. Maybe that's who you are. And that's why the Bible says, confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. Do you see how profound it is when we begin to love on each other and just take care of each other? Look, the whole world is against you and me. It's not true. They don't agree with us. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you the same. They don't agree with us. You know, all you have to do is keep a couple of names on the internet, and you'll see how many times people, faces would come up, and this guy is a heretic, this guy is a this, this guy, all he wants is your money. And they're talking about brothers and sisters in the Lord. It was a gentleman that I was talking to this week, and he was questioning why Benny Hinn wore a white suit. So I said, what does that got to do with anything? He said, I, well, you know, I just don't understand it. Why did, was he wearing a white suit? And I said, well, he had an anointing. He has, a, he has an anointing on his life. Yeah, I know, but, but why does he wear a white suit? So I said, I said, you remember in the book of John? <laughs> I said, the last chapter, he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, do you remember when, G when Peter came and actually, uh, or, or John came and he said, I'm the beloved of the Lord? And, and yeah, he goes, yeah, I remember that. I said, it's not funny. He was talking about himself. Yeah, 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 it was funny. And he said, and then he went to Jesus and said, what about this Peter? You know, what's going to happen to them, to him? Because I know what's going to happen to me. And, or is it Peter is the other way around? Uh, Peter, it's Peter the other way around. And what did Jesus say? What is it to you? So I said, what is it to you? So I looked and I said, what is it to you that he's wearing a white suit? What is the deal? <laughs> Can you get over the white suit? <laughs> you know? And so, you know, and sometimes people will sit there and it's like, well, I don't agree with him. Well, you don't have to agree with him. But if you begin to honor the anointing on a person's life, then you will begin to receive from them. And I realize that when you dishonor somebody who is anointed, you cannot receive from them. You cannot receive from them. No matter how much you try, or what, you cannot receive from somebody you dishonor. Because spiritually, you're doing something. And so when a person looks somebody, at somebody on, on TV and winning people to the Lord and so on, they're not perfect. But we're brothers, we're sisters, we are working on the same team. Amen? So when somebody starts talking to you about somebody, a pastor, or where they did this, just, just let, let, let all that go. We're working on the same team. It doesn't matter if they don't speak like we do, or we, we you know, not as good as them. It doesn't matter. We're on the same team. We're called to bless Come on, we're called to bless. So I just want you for a second, just not, don't, don't, don't do it right now because, <laughs> you know, we were dancing, me and Tracy yesterday, and the instructor, he says, just don't be creepy when you look in each other's eyes, you know, because sometimes you, you stand there and you just kind of stare in each other's eyes, and, you know. <laughs> so I said that, I said, you, you, you could look around, but don't be creepy by looking around. And just consider <laughs> why, you know, why that person is sitting beside you or why that person is going through whatever he's going through don't be creepy but just ask the lord what can i do to help how can i bring him out of that bondage that they're in what is my part in that what word can i say to them that it would help them to edify them to give them the strength to give them the hope to maybe go on for another day right if, if we began to think like that because if one hurt, then all hurt. One weak, then we're all weak. But if you and I begin to think like that, the glory of God will fill the house. 
Miracles will start popping up all over the place. The grace, the power of God will begin to flow because now we're not looking at each other to compare each other and, you know, to, I'm better or I'm... But we're looking at each other is that this is my brother, this is my sister. They need me. I need them. We're here together working together. If we put our head together and begin to pray for each other, I guarantee you we're going to have a church that's full. I don't like to see empty chairs because there, there, there needs... Other people need to hear this. But you're hearing something that I think sometimes we may be overworking to try to get the people to act. But if we just obeyed what we read, you're called to walk in this type of love. And so you may be questioning, why am I struggling? Maybe you're not obeying that law. Maybe you're looking at somebody else and you're, you're, you're rude or whatever the case may be. But, you know, and listen, I'm not perfect. Don't ask my family because they'll tell you. But I'm not Don't ask Byron either, dear God. But, you know, here's, here's one thing that I try to do is, you know, I, I forget sometimes how many people said some things about me. And on purpose, I, I go out of my way to be a blessing to people. On purpose, I do that. And someone says, well, you're, you're showing off. No, I'm just telling you that's something that I began to exercise. Did I like it the first time or the second time or the third time? I hated it. But I was being obedient. One thing I knew that I, my, my relationship with Jesus was much more greater how I, than how I felt. It was a decision that I have to make. And this decision is I said, Lord, I will obey you. And then when you start doing that, you say, I will obey you, then watch the blessing begin to flow. Then watch healing begin to flow. Then be, now be, be open to receiving from God. Some people here may be very nice here, but you're very rude to your wife. You're very rude to your husband. And maybe that's one of your problems is that you're not opening up to the Spirit of God and allowing healing to come take place in your home. Don't let that be you. Amen? Did I give you a good lecture today? <laughs> oh, I pray in the name of Jesus that we get this. See, I, I, it's good when you see people leaving. That's a good thing because that means... <laughs> it's, just, it's just the worship team. but They're not leaving. <laughs> I want to encourage you to be like that. I want to encourage you to step out of your comfort zone and begin to pour into other people's lives. Because they're beside you for a reason. They're your friend for a reason. The, you, you, you're not the judge. You're not the judge. You could judge the character, but don't judge the person. They might not be, and don't judge it to them, their face, they might not be as mature as you right they, maybe they're still green but can we love them where they are should we love them where they are you know one thing i know that i really believe that the spirit of the lord is helping me to share this with you and i know that the spirit of god is happy about this but sometimes again you know i heard joyce meyer say say something so profound she says uh, th she has a sermon and she wrote some powerful sermons about love. She said, this is the least popular sermons that I have is walking in love. And I thought, why is that? It's because a lot of times people do not receive that message. You know, stand up with me if, if you can for a moment.